All right, so uh, thanks for a very nice introduction. My name is William Wong. I am at the UC Santa Barbara, and today I'm going to talk about, you know, uh, building uh, systems that can promote um, healthy online discourse, and this is joint work with a lot of my students and collaborators. All right, so here's an outline of the presentation today. So first of all, we're gonna look at the motivation of this line of work is, you know, both of the two tasks are relatively new. Then I'll talk about a very important issue in NLP and also AI that is trying to understand the online hate speech. Then I'll talk about uh, some of the efforts from NLP community that tackles the uh, fake news issues. And then I'll briefly um, talk about some of the other research uh, work that we are looking at um, in UCSB's NLP group. All right. So um, I sort of want to bring up this topic by starting to note that, um, as some of you may know, every single year Pew Research does this survey on online harassment, okay? And last year, uh, they got the survey result back, and definitely the results uh, is um, telling us here uh, something that's very important uh, behind this. One uh, observation they had is that essentially four in ten Americans, uh, they have personally experienced online harassment. So this is a really serious issue. About 40% of us, if you engage in online discussions, you know, it could, you know, happen. And then some celebrities and a lot more uh, regular people like us, you know, have to quit, you know, Facebook and Twitter because of online attack, you know, serious issues like online stalking, and those things can really happen, okay? Um, what's more is that, you know, in this survey, they found 62% of the Americans, um, they found that, you know, this is really a serious issue, online harassment, including hate speech, cyberbullying, and you may be wondering, what about the others, you know, 38%? So among the 38%, 33% of them consider it still as a problem, and only 5% of the Americans don't really think this is a problem. So as you can see, there's a consensus on this being a problem, and many of us think this is a big issue. But what is the conclusion? Well, the conclusion in that survey is that really many of the uh, people who use the internet think that we should come up with better solutions, okay? And they do really want the tech firms to come up with better solutions to deal with this issue, okay? Um, there's no universal agreement on, you know, what is hate speech and what is, um, let's say, you know, free speech and how do you balance free speech and hate speech, but indeed, this is a very important issue. We don't want to have, like, censorship. On the other hand, we also don't want the web to be completely lawless where you, there could be fraud and all this crime. So there has to be a balancing point. But in today's presentation, I'm going to focus on a very important issue of looking at how technology can support us to understand online hate and understanding fake news. So um, I also want to bring up a very important um, aspect in today's talk is that I do really believe hate speech is a major issue in natural language processing, okay? It's not saying that, you know, parsing, um, you know, machine translation, these are not uh, important anymore, but I mean, I think those are still really important issues. But on the other hand, when you consider that 1% improvement in some specific tasks, well, that's definitely has merit, but then you have to think about a broader uh, spectrum and how hate speech may be completely disable some of the systems. For example, I know that a lot of you were at uh, Marie Ostendorf talk at the uh, NACO conference this year, and uh, she did brought up the issue that during the Alexa challenge, it is very possible that if your system were gamed and then your system were able to generate uh, some of the speech from adversarial users, then your system will be taken offline, right? So simple as that. So um, that's a huge issue if you don't know hate speech or your system is not aware of the language. Uh, similarly, we've seen similar things happening to uh, social media platform like Facebook and Twitter, and you can see this definitely caused a huge financial loss in the, you know, in the range of billions of dollars, and it definitely create a lot of the negative uh, 
uh, impacts on the society as a whole. Um, I would argue that for many of the NLP problems, NLP systems like machine translation, uh, uh, semantic role labeling, annotation, you, you know, with the semantic frames, it is still the case, right? So if your system is not aware of hate speech and then you translate it, you know, into something that is really inappropriate and present it to the user, well, you could have a big problem, okay? So the question is, how should we design systems to really understand hate speech and trying to you know, build systems that can uh, further um, uh, reduce the issue. Okay? Um, one thing that I've been looking at this year at NACO is really trying to understand uh, the basic uh, issue inside this problem. One thing we found with um, hate speech is that uh, it is often the case we have to deal with social media posts, and these posts, like tweets and Facebook posts, they are really, really short, okay? So what that means is that even though your neural network is very powerful, but the input is often like just one sentence. And with that very noisy sentence, it is definitely very tough to be able to understand, you know, the semantics and be able to uh, perform the detection accurately. So we argue that it is important to derive additional information to augment the input space and make your system more robust. So that's the issue I identified, and we came up with the solutions of leveraging users' public history and then trying to do inter-user similarity learning to augment the input space. So now your neural network is taking you know, much longer samples. You have more information determining whether this is something that is not appropriate, okay? Um, this is joint work with my student, uh, Jing, and my, and my colleague, Elisa Spelding. Um, the idea is relatively simple because, you know, the main idea, like I said before, is to leverage the intra-user representation learning. So you're trying to learn, okay, given the public tweets by the user, um, what can we learn about, you know, this particular user, right? So in general, what is the topic distribution? So we can perform representation learning on top of that. And the other thing we can do is to also uh, learn similar tweets uh, that is similar from this user but may not be posted by the user. So what we can do is to first do a randomized algorithm like a locality sensitive hash to partition the semantic space and then systematically find the ones that are similar to these original uh, Twitter posts. Then we can leverage this additional information and then perform representation learning together with the original tweets, okay? And then we'll see how that works. Well, in reality, uh, it works really well for us. So we uh, observe a 10 percent improvements over the by LSTM baselines and comparing to um, traditional method like SVM logistic regression, CNN models and also got a uh, pretty big improvement. So the idea is that you really have to leverage the you know, user's public history and also trying to learn um, additional similarity uh, based uh, learning uh, metrics and trying to combine that information in the input space so that you will have more information to figure out uh, how likely we should think that this is uh, going to be hate speech. Um, we followed this line of work and uh, recently we uh, had a paper at uh, ICWSM, so this is more like a linguistic study, but mainly trying to understand the hate target, okay? So is it directing towards an individual or is it directing towards a group? So we did find something very interesting um, and we performed linguistic analysis and uh, we also look at Luke and see how that uh, give us the clues about um, understanding hate speech. And I'm not gonna go through the details, but if you're interested, you can read that paper. One of the more recent work we've done this year at the MNLP is trying to understand the fine-grained um, hate speech and specifically hate group and hate target. So this is a picture by the Southern Poverty Law Center where it shows a whole bunch of hate groups in the United States. So the question we're asking here is that can we leverage this additional information and trying to understand better about um, the uh, topics related to hate speech and understand you know, different hate groups. So we propose a uh, hierarchical conditional VAE model. And the main idea in this model is that, you know, even though CVAE, a lot of you are familiar with, is a generative model, but we show that you can turn that into a discriminative model and achieve promising results in classification tasks. And uh, what's cool about this line of work is that, you know, we can learn to predict 
the category information uh, together with the hit group information. Um, the architecture looks slightly complicated, but in the training time, essentially you can have a posterior network and you can have a prior network. In the testing time, you then replace the posterior network with the prior network. So in the training time, you have a label about hit group and hit categories, but in the testing time, we don't have the information, but we can automatically infer this information, and you can use one uh, type of information to uh, infer the other type, and that will give you a uh, much better result. So in this line of work, we've been looking at a relatively larger data set, so we collected about uh, 3.5 million tweets uh, related to these 40 uh, hate groups across certain categories, and we found that um, indeed using this hierarchical uh, CVAE model that we proposed got a much better result in terms of the uh, weighted F1 for the full data set. We can also look at a subset and found that the improvement is even more salient if you're looking at a relatively smaller set, okay? So uh, that's just the hate speech part. Like I said, it's an important problem, but then there's also other issues that a lot of the tech companies in the Bay Area care about. Uh, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about fake news. So fake news in the NLP community, there are a couple of um, uh, groups that are looking at this problem recently. So uh, we wrote a paper on liar data set last year at ACL. So it was the first large scale annotated data set mainly from political fact. So it covers a whole spectrum of the different uh, you know, news statements. It could be from interviews, political campaign, can be from Facebook, can be from Twitter. So in general, they are really, really short, just one sentence, okay? So that's really tough. We found that you know, even with the metadata, uh, it is still very difficult to be able to categorize them into very fine grained categories like you know, um, barely true or half true or uh, true or fake, right? So that would be much harder uh, comparing to the whole article. But we show that at least with metadata, it can really help. Um, this year, there's a very interesting paper from University of Sheffield, and they've been looking at Wikipedia data as a way to test systems in NLP, how you can design automated fact checkers. And the main idea is that, you know, uh, you have the statement, but I can design a system to retrieve uh, the evidence from uh, Wikipedia, and then you can perform classification and trying to infer whether this um, statement is supported by the evidence or not, and they had a very successful challenge, so uh, that's some of the recent studies in this area. Um, we did uh, look uh, deeper in this area because, you know, fake news is, again, a very controversial topic, but what's not controversial is that at least people all agree there's a spectrum of um, political ideology, right? So uh, we've been looking at ways to understanding um, political ideology better, specifically we've been looking at the network information, the image, we've been looking at a post, social media post, all together in a joint variational inference framework where we can first use a regressor to infer the um, uh, means and variance and then reparameterize that um, in the VAE framework, then we can perform gener um, um, prediction and also generation um, at the same time. So uh, that is uh, what we're doing right now, and the experimental result also suggests that uh, it is very promising. So we've been looking at a relatively larger data set uh, for this problem with 120 news articles sampled from uh, 59 US-based uh, news sources, and if you look at the um, prediction accuracy of trying to predict uh, whether this article is from left, right, or uh, uh, the middle, uh, we can get to about 80% uh, percent, uh, F measure when you're looking at the network feature, the title, the content, um, the you know, images, and all together, uh, which is uh, definitely much better improvement comparing to the standard method that uses only text um, and uh, network information. Uh, what's cool about this um, new model is that it also allows us to visualize uh, the attention weights uh, that we can specifically look at in this example. Uh, the uh, top ones are the you know, highlighted uh, uh, higher weights with uh, the uh, left, and the bottom ones are highlighted worse computed by attention uh, for the right, and you did see uh, something that is very uh, related to your own perception of uh, how these words may be associated with uh, different parties. 
Another thing is that we can also look at the aggregated result of the predictions from our system. So essentially what we can do in here is trying to uh, look at the ranking okay, of all the predictions and then we can rank um, whether, you know, uh, how many of them are um, uh, from the left and how many of them from the right by looking at the output from your system. So uh, we did visualize it and see this uh, also corresponds to uh, people's general impression about this media. For example, CNN and um, uh, Washington Post, they're more on the left side and then there are things like, um, you know, NPR and uh, routers, these are pretty much uh, relatively in the middle and on the right hand side you will see things like Breitbart, um, Infowars, which is uh, very well known to be um, the, uh, the extreme uh, right um, political ideology, okay. Um, to conclude uh, what I just briefly talked about, um, I think the main message in today's presentation is that uh, these um, important problems in NLP we ignored a lot in the past, but I do believe they have a lot of values in today's uh, particular uh, application and the technical uh, development, right? Because like I said, 1% improvement is important, but on the other hand, if your system misbehaves, then you're gonna have a big problem. Your whole product will be taken offline. So we should really think about how would you, uh, how can we advance uh, the socially advanceable, uh, uh, responsible NLP techniques that allows us to deal with uh, these kind of issues that really will uh, have a big impact on your product and also show that you know, it's very important to look deeper at the data you have rather than doing just simple classification but really trying to understand the targets and perform more fine-grained analysis if it's necessary. Um, the other thing is the uh, uh, performance issue, right? So we show that uh, if you only look at text data, well, it can give you a certain performance, but you do really need to look at the multi-view models and multi-model information to allow you to bring up the performance, okay? Um, there's a still probably uh, two or three minutes. I want to briefly talk about uh, some of the other work that we've been doing at UCSB. We are a relatively new group, uh, but we do research in a lot of areas in NLP. So uh, I'm gonna talk about a few things we didn't talk about today. Uh, so we, for example, we focus on information extraction. We've been looking at relation extraction and trying to understand the entities and their relations. Specifically, we focus on distance supervision. Uh, this year's ACL, we have two attempts of looking at reinforcement learning and several learning trying to denoise the distance supervision data for relation extraction. We've been also looking at the issue of language and vision. So how can we understand text and image at the same time and perform um, image or video caption, video captioning and also do storytelling and map the actions and language to some a specific action space. Uh, so we've been looking at hierarchical reinforcement learning, for example, for um, the uh, video captioning um, topic, and then essentially we show that you have to look at hierarchical information um, together with uh, the low level information to be able to generate more structured text in the reinforcement learning framework. Uh, this year at ACL, we show that um, for a lot of the generation problems, specifically visual storytelling, uh, pretty much Rouge, Meteor, and uh, Blue are broken. So if you look at the numbers, it's likely that your system can just game the metric and get really good result, but then we have to uh, think about reward learning and automatically learn the generation metrics to be able to get uh, realistic improvement gains for these kind of problems. And um, now, more recently, I've been looking at a thing uh, called uh, combining model-based and model-free RL, uh, how we can essentially leverage both information in the uh, language and vision navigation problems. Um, so that's pretty much language and vision, but um, you know, I know the last session was a spoken language understanding, so being also very interested in this particular area of designing uh, test-oriented dialogue systems, been looking at how do you generate an emotional response for this year's ACL. So this upcoming MNLP, we've been looking at the cross-link or dialogue systems. So if you don't have annotations in English, uh, if you have annotation only in English, but not in the target language, well, you can leverage that information and then perform generation problems. Um, so, um, you know, as many of you know, we did the RL tutorial at ACL this year. So RL is a big focus um, in our lab right now. So uh, we've been looking at fundamental optimization uh, problems for RL, for example, combining human demonstration in a scheduling uh, algorithm 
together with RL to obtain better performance for uh, robot language navigation problems. We've also been looking at how would you uh, do RL in the context of semi-supervised learning for text classification. So that also got us uh, really good performance. And finally, for AI, I see a lot of good work today. Uh, for example, from Hoi Fung's talk that talk about um, you know knowledge graph specifically in that session. So we're also very interested in this area and has some related work um, in the past uh, one or two years. So with all that, I would like to thank all of my collaborators, students, and sponsors for their support. And feel free to come by our website if you have any questions. Thank you.